For millennia, people from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds have found direction and encouragement in the inspired pages of the Bible. In his day, Jesus directed listeners to search the prophecies of Scripture to find Him the only way of salvation. 2,000 years later, as we stand on the break of eternity, we no less need the purpose and hope God's Word provides. Sacramento Central Church brings you Receiving the Word, timely Bible messages presented by pastors Chris Buttery and Mike Thompson. Amazing revelations await you in God's Holy Word, the Bible. The very first book of the Bible and the very first verse says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That was the beginning of earth's history. The history of humanity. But what was before that? What was before the beginning? According to the Bible, God and angels existed before mankind was created. John 1.1 1, 1 talks of an earlier beginning. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 2 says the same, that same Word was in the beginning with God. Later in John 1, verse 14, it says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, which we understand could only be Jesus who became a man. So Jesus was the Word who has always been with God and is God. So who exactly is God? When we look at Jesus, can we see everything there is of God? Of Christ, the Bible says, for in him dwells the fullness or all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So the fullness of God in the form of a body? But can we actually see or understand all that fullness? I sure can't. We just trust what the Bible says, that it's telling us the truth, that the Son of God really is fully God. Well, if the fullness of God is in the Son of God, I would say the fullness of God must be in God the Father also. Wouldn't you say that makes sense? But do we understand that any more than we can understand it being in the Son. Now, the Holy Spirit is called God in the Bible, in Acts 5, 3, and 4. And the Holy Spirit is said to be one with the Father and the Son. That's 1 John 5, 7. Do you think the fullness of God dwells in the Holy Spirit also? In my study, I'm convinced of that, and you would have to just study it out, but... Um, but we have this Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the fullness of God is in all three of them. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. That was John 10, 30. Ooh, what does that mean? Jesus also said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's John 14, 9. So are they two persons or the same person? Are there two gods or one God? So we have three persons, three separate persons, but one God. Now, this is clear in the New Testament, but it's not so clear in the Old Testament. But Jesus pretty much said that it was he who spoke to Moses from the burning bush when Jesus said in John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. One has to wonder if there are many encounters with God in the Old Testament that were actually with the Son. I believe many were, and that's another study that I encourage you to make. Now, even in the Hebrew Shema, that's Deuteronomy 6.4, it's the most repeated phrase by every good and faithful Jew, there's evidence for the Godhead. Deuteronomy 6.4 says, The Lord, our God, is one Lord. 
Now, on the surface, it appears that only one person can be God, which is what every Jew thinks. However, the Hebrew word one, the Hebrew word ikad, or ikad, is a word that can be singular or plural in the Hebrew. Now, if it's singular, it means number one or the quantity of just one. If it's plural, the meaning is to unify or to unite some or a few into one. See the difference? It's plural. The same word, ikad, is translated as one in Genesis when it talks about Adam and Eve becoming one flesh. It's used the same way. Now, if you find all this hard to understand, don't sweat over it. I mean, some of us have just said, well, that's what it says, we believe it, and so we accept it, but that's not the same thing as understanding it. Okay? We accept it. I think only God himself really understands it. I mean, and, and the good thing is, we're not saved by how smart we are anyway. Now, there are infinite aspects of God that are way beyond us. And to some extent, always will be, even for all eternity. However, knowledge and a deeper understanding can be very helpful. We're going to take a shot at it this morning. Does the Bible speak more specifically about God's infinite nature? It does. It actually does quite a bit. Take your Bibles. I want you to open them because we're not going to put this one on the screen. I want you to open your Bible to Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Say amen when you're there. All right, that sounds pretty good. All right, Isaiah 46, verse 9. It said, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am the Lord and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. God says there's no other God. No one like him. And his reason is, he says, because I declare the end from the beginning. What's that mean? You know, one of my favorite authors explains it this way in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 43. It says, He that ruleth in the heavens is one who sees the end from the beginning the one before whom the mysteries of the past and the future are alike outspread. Now, if God can view time, the end from the beginning, the past and the future alike outspread, that means God is not stuck in time. God can view time sort of like I put together a research paper. You know, this is what I did. After all my research was done, I would take my notes, my quote cards, and sometimes books opened and marked, and I would have it all spread out before me. And then I would start picking out something here and something here that's going to go in the beginning. And after I get my beginning worked up, I find something here and something here is going in the middle, and I find things in different places, and I put it together. It's all spread out before me alike. But when the professor reads my paper... He reads it in chronological order, like we must live in time. But God sees time all spread out before him. He sees the end, the middle, and the beginning all at the same time. So one aspect of God's infinite nature is that he can be outside of time, not controlled by time like we are. Isaiah 44, 6 says, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. you believe it? Now, was three and one hard to understand? How about a God who can be both outside and inside of time? Can you understand that? And we're just getting warmed up. This is kind of exciting stuff for me. 
So let's go to Isaiah 40. Open your Bibles to Isaiah 40, just a couple chapters back. And Isaiah 40, uh, we're going to go to verse 28. This was part of our scripture reading, the last part. All right, Isaiah 40, 28. We're going to look at some other verses in Isaiah 40, so when we're done, don't close your Bible. Isaiah 40, 28. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. So God never gets tired, and there's no end to his understanding. So the question is, how smart is God? What's his IQ? It's completely immeasurable. Can you understand that? I can't. I just accept it. Okay? Now, in Isaiah 40, we're going to go to my favorite part now. Isaiah 40, let's go to verse 12 this time. Isaiah 40, verse 12. I love this one. It says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the balances, weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance. Think about that. The waters in the hollow of his hand. The waters here means the seas. All right, so we're talking about the oceans of our planet. Okay? They fit in the hollow of God's hand. And, and it says he can weigh our mountains on scales. Go to verse 15. Verse 15. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket. That's not even a full bucket. It's after you throw the water out and there's a drop still in there. Okay? The nations are as a drop in the bucket and are counted as small dust on the scales. Think about that. He can, I mean, I already said something about the nation, but the small dust on a balance or a scale is the dust that doesn't even affect the measurement. Okay? Verse 17 is really interesting. Uh, the nation's forum is nothing, but let's go down to 21 and 22. This is really, it gets really cool. Uh, 21 and 22. Verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are at like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Isn't that cool? What do you picture when it says God stretches out heavens, the heavens as a curtain? Can you picture all the solar systems and galaxies, hundreds and thousands of light years across, an endless expanse? And to God, it's like we can pull or open or close a curtain. But the last line, I think, is the coolest one. The last line. Look at the end of verse 22. Spreads him out like a tent to dwell in. God spreads out the heavens as a tent to dwell in. What do you picture here? The universe is being pictured as a tent which God can put up and he can go in and he can go out as he pleases like you or me when we go camping. That's the heavens, the universe to God. It's just a tent. Wait, 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 wait. I thought the universe was unending and infinite. Isn't that what we're told? Well, to humans, it is unending and infinite because it's beyond our reach. It's beyond our capacity to measure. But it is not infinite to God. After all, he made it all. Now, sometimes people stop there and say, ah, you're just misinterpreting it. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived after Jesus, Understood this well. Let's go to Second Chronicles chapter six. Second Chronicles chapter six. This is a passage that we're going to look at. It's in the Bible three times. C 
See, Solomon, when he built the temple, in his prayer of dedication, he asked the question, how such a God could come and dwell with men on earth in a house that man built for him, the temple. Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 18. This is part of Solomon's prayer. Everyone with me? It says, But will God indeed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, much less this temple which I have built. Solomon said that the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. That is, nothing can contain the almighty, infinite God. Not Solomon's temple, not the sky, not the universe, not anything. So how big is God? He can't be measured. But the amazing thing is, the very next chapter, 2 Chronicles 7, 12, it says that God did come down and his glory filled Solomon's temple. He did come to dwell with them. And why did God come to dwell with them? Because he loved them. He wanted to be with them. And he wanted to help them. That's love. By the way, can you measure how much God loves? How much does God love? You can't measure it. It's beyond measure. He's all loving. Okay, so let's, let's review a little bit where we're at here. When we say God is infinite, we found first that he's outside of time, and now we have found that he's outside of space. He's beyond space. You can't measure his age. He has no beginning and no end. You can't measure his size. We also saw one verse that said his understanding is, you know, without beyond searching. In other words, you can't measure his intelligence. The Bible definition of infinite, when it applies to God, and, it, and God is the only one that's ever applies to, is totally beyond measure. God is totally without measure. Now, as far as intelligence goes, does anyone know the, uh, the big word for all-knowing? We call it omniscient, omniscient or om, omniscience, or om, omniscience. Only God is omniscient. All-knowing knows everything. By the way, are we, how powerful is God? All right, all-powerful. And what's the word for that? Omnipotent. We find that in the Bible. We find that in Handel's uh, Hallelujah Chorus. Revelation 19.6 is where... Handel got it. For the Lord omnipotent reigneth. Omnipotence. Only God is omnipotent, all powerful. Well, we've almost covered everything, but we've got to ask this question. Where is God? Now, we usually think of the Holy Spirit when we think of God as omnipresent, meaning everywhere present. That means God can hear and answer millions of prayers all at the same time. Aren't you glad you can do that? Imagine if you had to be on a waiting list. It could take a few years for your turn to come up, maybe even a decade. But not only do you not have to wait, God says he can answer before you ask or even finish asking. Listen to Isaiah 65, 24, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they're yet speaking, I will hear. Don't you love that? Aren't you glad God is omnipresent and omniscient, all-knowing? He knows our needs better than we do. He knows our thoughts before we speak and probably before we have them. If he can see the end from the beginning, he knows every thought before it even happens. Now, after trying to grasp the nature of God, the fullness of God 
is, what, is how Paul described it when he said the fullness of God was in Jesus. That fullness of God is the totally beyond measure aspects we've looked at. And Paul was saying all of that was in Jesus. Jesus wasn't short any of it. Not a speck. Now, after trying to grasp all this, do you think that any created being could be equal to God? <laughs> that would be a pipe dream. That would be delusion. But what about if all created beings voted for or supported another created being to be God? If they all were on the other side, would that work? Is anyone or anything other than God infinite by this definition of infinite? No, nothing else even close. Now, are you wondering what all this has to do with Genesis 1 through 12? If you'll bear with me, it will start to become clear soon. All of this is for a better understanding of the origin of the great controversy what the issues were, and why it happened. But first, a little more background. Let's go back before man was created, or before any beings were created, before God even made the angels. The almighty, infinite God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, decide to create the angels, and so they do it. God speaks angels into existence, so whoever way he decides to do it, and it's done. How can these, how can the infinite God be understood by limited, finite angels that he has just made? They won't naturally understand his power. They won't naturally understand that he's all-knowing. They won't naturally understand his eternal existence. And they won't naturally understand how great his love is. And they won't know that he can already read their thoughts. So what will God have to do? He'll have to teach them. The infinite God had to reveal himself to them on the level of their ability to understand. To do it all at once would have been complete overload. So it was something that was going to take time. And since God is love, and they were all created perfect, and since God provided everything for their happiness, it promised to be a fun journey of learning. And it was, for eons of time. Now, since God knows what's best for the happiness of his creatures, he must ensure their full cooperation by giving them an idea of his majesty and power, because after all, if you resist the source of life, what will result? Death. And God doesn't want that to happen. So they have to understand full cooperation is necessary. They must know that he is supreme, that he has authority. Which member of the Godhead revealed that to them? And how? Which member of the Godhead? What do you, what do you think? Jesus couldn't do it. The Holy Spirit couldn't do it. Think about it. When Jesus comes at the second coming, we're going to see him that way. The angels didn't see him that way. They saw the Father. God the Father. Now follow me. 
This is really important because you cannot really understand Luther's rebellion without getting this. Not, I mean, you'll understand it fuller, let's put it that way. 1 Timothy 60, 16 says that God only has immortality, dwelling in light which no man can approach, and he has power everlasting. So it says there that the Father dwells in light unapproachable. So God the Father would be seen by the angels in a bright, dazzling light that they could not even approach. It was so spectacular and glorious. That would be, uh, they would be in awe of his majesty and power for sure, wouldn't they? Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. It's really important that you follow here, and I think you'll enjoy it. But in Bible history on earth, God has shown himself in this light unapproachable. His glory often shows as a fire. Uh, Hebrews 12.29 says, Our God is a consuming fire. So whether you think of it as a fire or a dazzling bright light, doesn't really matter. But you think about Moses at the burning bush. There you got it. Moses had to take off his shoes because he was on holy ground. He could only approach so close. You think about Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, the light of unapproachable came down on the top of the mountain and created an earthquake and scared the dickens out of everybody. They certainly got that this is unapproachable. Well, think about the sanctuary. Was there a light there? The Shekinah glory over the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God. And then we have other individuals, prophets who saw this glory and vision, like uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. They saw fire or a bright light, Shekinah glory. Elijah saw it come down from heaven and consume a sacrifice. It stopped Paul in his tracks on the road to Damascus. And in the second coming, every eye will see it. So glad that you've been able to tune in and watch this very important message presented by one of my associates, Pastor Fred Dana, before the beginning. He's been talking about the nature of God and the entrance of sin. And we're going to talk more about the beginning of sin, not only in heaven, but also here on planet Earth. So we want you to join us next week when we look at part two of Before the Beginning. We're so glad you decided to tune in to today's Receiving the Word program. If you have a special prayer request, we would be happy to pray about it for you. To discover more about the Bible through our free online Bible studies or to listen to more life-changing Bible messages, go to sacentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. If you've been blessed or encouraged by our ministry and God impresses you to support us, then visit our website or write to us at 6045 Camellia Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95819. Always gladly receive God's Word.